the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of this terrible sword. So his truth is marching on. You probably noticed uh, this morning, based upon the songs that were chosen, and I'm thankful that, that Jinky led them, that we're talking about something in relation to the Lord's death, to His death on the cross for our sin. What I want to focus on this morning is the Lord's Supper. And I want to address this in maybe a unique way. I want you to think about, if you will, what you focus upon. What do you do? What do you think about when you're partaking of the Lord's Supper? I want you to view this lesson and the points that we're going to bring from the eyes of your heart, if you will, from the eyes of your mind. As you're sitting there, and in about half an hour or, or less, we're going to be partaking together of the Lord's Supper. And what are you going to be doing? What are you going to be focused upon in the eyes of your mind? That's what I want to talk about. Here are some things, seven aids, if you will. And I'm going to use a numerical system, the number one, the number two, through seven to hopefully help you when you are partaking of the Lord's Supper, for those who might need that, a, a, a mnemonic device, if you will, a way to, to, to know and to think about what you need to focus upon, to help you to keep your mind where it needs to be, on one thought and one thought alone, and that is the death of Jesus Christ and what He went through. And again, I, I joked with you a couple of weeks ago about having seven points. I know I don't ever seem to make it through that, but I'm going to, to minimize the time I spend on each point and get all of these in. Lord willing, seven aids, seven things to help us remember to in His death. And we've got to start with the number one. And when I think of the number one, I think about the fact that there is one Lord. What does that mean to us? As you're sitting there and you're focused upon the Lord's Supper, and the eyes of your mind begin to, to see Gethsemane, you begin to see Calvary and the, the place there on the hill, and it, it, it looks somewhat like a skull, and on that hill there is three crosses and, and, and on the middle cross there, there is Jesus Christ. There is one Lord. And when He instituted the Lord's Supper, the first thing He says is that He is going to, to, uh, to, to break this bread. He's breaking it for these apostles, these disciples. And He says to them to take eat of that bread because it represents His body which is given for them. And so there's two emblems, there's two aspects. There is the body and then there in about verse uh, 20, he references the cup, the cup of the New Testament. The blood that that represents that He shed for us. So you've got the body, you've got the blood. When you think about the one Lord, but what does that really mean to us? There's more to it than just saying there's a body. Just saying there's, there's blood. That means something. There's something we need to be focused on. Well, what are they? In regards to the body, we know that the body of Christ that was pierced for us is about and represents for us the church. You see, He died to establish the fact that we could, through His blood, ultimately be saved. He gave His body so that we could be in His body, if you will. So that we could be placed in His church when we become Christians. Ephesians 4 talks about the fact that just as much as there is one Lord, there is one body. There's one God, one Spirit, one faith, one hope, all of these things, but one body. And Paul had already said in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, what that body is. Paul says that, that Christ has been given uh, the headship. Everything's been placed under His feet, and He has been, become head of the body, comma, verse 23, which is His church, the fullness uh, of Him that filleth all in all. That's what the body is. It is the church. And so when we think about the body, we think about the church that He died to establish and how that we're part of that church, but there's more to it. There's that blood. And he references the fact that the blood is in relation to the New Testament. You see, in order to become part of the body or the church, he established his last will and testament, the New Testament. And by reading that New Testament, we learn how to become part of that church, how to be faithful to our Lord. And he shed that blood to establish it so that you and I would have that opportunity to become Christians. Here's the point. When you think about the body and you think about the blood, the New Testament, it forces you and it forces me to examine ourselves. Not only do we focus on the Lord, but when I think about the Lord, I think about me. I think about where I stand, and each of us should, and where we are, right? That's exactly what he says, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You see this connection in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as Paul would add some more detail by inspiration as to how the body and the blood apply to us. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 29. He reminds them of, of what we just read, a reference there in Luke 22. He reminds them of the Lord 
establishing the, the communion at that Last Supper. And look at verse 27. Wherefore, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Why am I going to be guilty of that? In what sense? Look at verse 28. Let a man examine himself. Not only think about the Lord and what He did, but you think about yourself. Think about where you fit into this picture and what you're doing at that moment. Let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I looked up that word discerning. Because I got to thinking about it. Is, is he talking about really here one partaking of the Lord's Supper and they're not being faithful? Or is he talking about how you're partaking of the Lord's Supper? And when you look at that word discerning, it becomes very clear. Although the application could be made to both. The discerning means to separate. It means literally to channel one's mind. And it, and it brings it to focus. You're channeling your mind. You're focused upon. You're separating Christ from everything else in your week. And you're channeling your thoughts upon Him. You're focused upon Him and Him alone. And to not do so, to eat of that bread and to drink of that cup as they were, like it's a common meal, just doing anything else like any other day, is to partake of it unworthily. I've got to focus on my Lord and what He did, and I've got to focus on what I'm doing. I've got to focus on myself and what's going on in my own mind, where my life is ultimately, of course, as well in relationship to that body and to that blood. But I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So there's one Lord to begin with. But then we go to the number two. And when I think of the number two, I, I think about those thieves. There were two thieves, one on either side of our Lord. And so you're, you're in the mind, you're, you're, your eyes are there, you're focused on the cross. And as you zoom out a little bit, or even as you uh, look at it from Jesus' point of view, panoramically, he, you look to the right, you look to the left, and there on, uh, across the, the arms of each of Him is a thief. A thief. And 760 years ago, I'll go ahead and put both of these up here. Mark 15 references that. But about 760 years ago, before this had happened, Isaiah prophesied. He prophesied that he would be numbered with these criminals, these transgressors. In other words, when I think of the two thieves, I think about the fact that Jesus was not only physically maimed and, and brutalized, and we'll talk about that, but also the mental aspect of this. Jesus was being accused of being something He wasn't. He was accused of doing wrong when He hadn't done wrong. He was accused of being like these thieves, no better than them. Absolutely a criminal. Have you ever been accused of something you didn't do? I... I, this is like, maybe it's a pet peeve for me. Maybe everybody's like this, but I cannot stand. I just, I absolutely despise it when I hurt someone or someone's disappointed in me for something I didn't do, right? Have you ever had that happen? And this is, this is a, maybe a silly illustration, but, you know, a lot of times this happens in, in our marriage. Amber and I, I'll, I'll, maybe something's misplaced or maybe something happens and, and chances are I probably did misplace it, but I don't remember misplacing it. And so I'll tell Amber it wasn't my fault. But she might be disappointed because she knows I did. She knows I did, and she's right. But, but I'm saddened by that. I don't like that because I think to myself, I didn't do that. You know, that's not even a reality. The fact is, I probably did do it. We're talking about something to the millionth extreme times, what, what I'm talking about. Our Lord was absolutely innocent, and yet He was treated like the worst person that ever walked the face of the earth. Could you imagine what that felt like mentally for our Lord? Looking on either side of Him, He was absolutely numbered as a criminal. I think about the thieves in the mental anguish of my Lord. Number three, <clears throat> we zoom out and, and get the bigger picture here of what is going on and we see not only the Lord and the two thieves but, but what they're laying on, what they're nailed to and that is three crosses. Three crosses. And, and this is interesting to me because the Bible makes it very clear and it almost just comes out and says it that each of these crosses represents something. Each of them is very symbolic in the eyes of our Lord. Nothing was by chance. Nothing was a mistake. Nothing was an accident. Everything means something. And it's shared with us. And he talks about what was going on on each cross. For example, back uh, to Luke, Luke 23, 39. You remember, and to begin with, you remember both thieves were railing on Christ. But when you get to, to Luke 23 here, you see one thief in particular. He's continuing to rail on Christ. And there in about verse 39, you see him reference it to Christ. He says to Christ, if, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. Talking about the thieves. Save all of us, let's get down from here and go on our way. But the Bible says he railed on him. 
What that word means, what it tells us is his tone. It tells us the attitude and the tone with which he made that statement. He wasn't saying, Christ, please, if, if you're willing, if, if you're the Christ, please save us. That's not what he... He wasn't saying it like that. He was railing on him. He was mocking him. His intention was, was that of ugliness, wickedness. Right? If you're the Christ, save us. Get us down from here. Right? You're the big shot. You're, get, fix this, Christ. He didn't believe it. He didn't believe he actually could do it. He was railing on him. He was rebuking him. And so that first cross, that cross of that thief represents the cross of rejection. That's what it represents. It's, a, it's an individual who absolutely rejected Christ, even witnessing his very death. Right? I think about the obvious application there. As, as you think about the world, and sometimes even through their words, they rail on him verbally, but probably more most of the time. It's people rejecting him by their actions, the decisions that they make and choose. Maybe even we sometimes reject him as symbolized by that thief. But then there's that other thief. Right? The cross of repentance. The, the other thief there, and he, he originally railed on Christ. I mean, that, think about it. That's you and me. We, we've all been there. We've all been in sin. We've rejected Christ through our actions. But we have the opportunity to repent. And that's what this thief did. He repented and, and he says to, 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 to... He rebukes, rather, I should say. Here he rebukes the other thief in his act of repentance and tells him, are you, you don't fear God when you're in the same condemnation? You're in the same situation here and, and you're not going to fear God. He rebukes him for that. He's, he's penitent and he says, you know what, I don't need to be, I don't need to be re, uh, re, rebuking my Lord. And he calls him king. He calls him uh, master. He talks about the kingdom and, and how he wants to be part of that. I don't know that he even really understood what the kingdom was. But maybe he had heard John the Baptist or Christ preaching about that kingdom and he wanted to be part of it. He believed Christ. He, there was a moment in which he said, you know what, this man, I, I believe it. He wouldn't go through all this if it wasn't real. I, I, I want to partake in what he's offering me. And so there's that thief, that, the cross of repentance. But here's the problem, is there's a lot of folks today who believe that, that you can be saved in the same way that the thief was saved. And they want to almost have their salvation through the thief instead of through Christ because at that point there was no uh, New Testament. It, it was being established, but it wasn't yet concrete. It wasn't yet in force. He was dying under the old law, Hebrews 9, 15 through 17. Jesus was still alive speaking to him, and Jesus saved him. Matthew 9 and verse 6, he could save anybody when he was on earth. It's not the way that the thief on the cross was saved that we're saved. We need repentance, sure, but it's not the baptism of John, and it's not... Uh, something that, that, that we can partake of that, that the thief did. To have Jesus look at us and, and say that. Luke 23, 40, by the way, referencing there, their rebuke. But we think of Christ, John 14 and verse 6, the final cross and, and the one that, that matters most to us today, the one that we want to take part in, that is, and that is the cross of redemption. I am the way, the truth, and the light. And, and you could say, you know, that this is narrow-minded. Well, Jesus said it was a narrow way. It was a narrow path. You can either be on that path, the, the one cross of redemption, the only cross that can save us from our sin, or we can go down the path, the only alternative there of, of Satan himself. Three crosses. The cross of redemption, the cross of repentance, and the cross of rejection or rebellion. I think of when I think of those crosses. Where are we in that picture? But then the number four. When I think of the number four, I think about those garments. And, and there's a great picture here. <clears throat> you see this in, in John. 19, 23, and 24, and they, they begin to take his, his garments and his undergarments to begin with, and they, they have seams in them, and they tear them down the seams, and they pass them out between these four soldiers. But something interesting happens. They get to the, uh, the outer garment, okay, the, uh, the, the, the coat, if you will, of what Christ was wearing. And remember, he's, he's standing up there uh, to that cross completely immodest. His clothes have been removed. Right? It's not pictured necessarily appropriately in the paintings and such, uh, and I don't know how wise that is anyways, but in those depictions, uh, it would be immodest to show him how he truly was. Right? He, he was up there naked. And so they have his garments, and they're, they get to this outer garment, and it's very significant. In fact, if you uh, had read some of the bulletins maybe a few weeks ago, we talked, I talked a little about this, but just in case, let me just briefly mention that that tunic was seamless. There was no seam in it. That's why they cast lots. In fact, the psalmist, uh, he prophesied of this in Psalm 22, 18. They're going to tear my garments, but they're going to cast lots for my vesture. There, there's this one garment, there's no seam in it. It's seamless. And instead of ripping it and tearing it, for whatever reason, they decided that they would just cast lots, roll the dice, if you will, and, and one of them would win that code and they would keep it for themselves. 
Now see, that's very symbolic. Number one, because uh, the, the high priest that Jesus is, Hebrews talks all about this, that, that He was our high priest, and that seamless coat represents that. The high priest wore a seamless coat, and our Lord was seamless. He was without sin. But here's what I really want you to focus on. Why did they want to keep from tearing that? Why would they want to, one of them to just get to have that for themselves? You know, I wonder, just speculation, but it, it wasn't because they wanted to fulfill the prophecy. We can be sure of that. I can't help but think that, that maybe they thought to themselves, you know, I, I don't, this man probably is nothing, but this is a huge event in history. This is a big, big event that's going to be remembered. And people are going to pass this down and talk about this, and, and I want a souvenir from that. I don't want to tear this. I want, maybe, maybe they had that conversation. I don't know. But I, I do know this. Here's the application I want to pull from this. And that is that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it's, if you will, a souvenir for us. It's, it's what we have to hold on to. It's what we have every Lord's Day to get together and to remember. That's what a souvenir, it reminds you every time you see it. I wonder what that soldier thought every time he saw that garment, whether he put it in his home, wherever he placed it. But what, what do you think of, right? It's a souvenir. It's something to help us remember and to see the seamless Christ, the sinless Christ that this reminds us of when we think about those garments. I need to keep going. Number five here. Number five. There were five... <clears throat> Excuse me, five wounds. Five wounds. To begin with, I want you to, to think about exactly how this took place. And I'm not going to go into detail of the scourging and all that. I, that's for another time. But I want you to think about the cross itself. As they would, they would lay that cross down, and they would create these wounds. Okay, They would put the, the three nails. That's going to be four wounds, of course, through his, both of his feet, and then one nail in each of his, of his hands. That one nail through both of his feet, I should say. And they would take that cross after they nailed him to it. Maybe they had a rope on top, some would, uh, historians say, and, and they would lift that up, pulling on that rope, and there would be a hole in there in the ground. And that cross would fall down into that hole. And it's interesting because in Psalm twenty-two fourteen, there's a prophecy about his bones being disjointed. And I almost think that, that there's a picture. In fact, Josephus writes about this, about how the, the bones would get disjointed as that cross would fall and how much that would hurt. And surely and certainly as Christ fell down into that hole and His whole body jarred on those nails, very possible. His bones weren't broken now. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But it is very possible that He felt extreme pain. I'm sure that He did. And maybe even some of His bones became disjointed because of that. But you've got the four wounds and of course that, that disjointing that's involved in it. But the, the, the three nails, the four wounds there, and of course the fifth one would be in John 19.34 when... Uh, the, remember, they, they showed up, and this is where the bones come into play. And, and they, they break the legs of the thieves. They wanted to make sure that they were dead before the uh, Sabbath. And, and you remember that the Lord was already dead. But they took that spear, and the fifth wound, they thrust it there into His side. And forthwith, the Bible says, came blood and water. Five wounds. And what those wounds remind us of is that through those wounds we, of course, get to be saved. I mean, you think about Christ and you think about the death, you, you've got to think about what He went through. You've got to focus on those wounds because those wounds were there for you and for me. And it's through that blood and, and the symbolism there of the water and blood being mixed together as they're coming out in baptism in which we're, we're mingled there spiritually. The blood of Christ is there in the water as we're baptized and, and we're going through that and entering into His body almost through that wound, if you will. And it's, What a great picture that God gave for us, but but an awful thing that had to happen in order for that to be possible. I think about the wounds and I think about what that means for you and for me as we can become Christians. But Psalm 34, 20, not a bone was broken. Not a, that's what we can be sure of. No bone was broken. And I wonder, I've thought about this and I've studied this and, and I wonder the significance of this. I really do. The Bible doesn't really just come out and say the significance, but, but I do think about His body and that structure and how... Those bones are always together. No matter what happened to the exterior, the internal Christ was, was still put together, if you will. And we're in the church, and, you know, and, and it makes me smile. We can talk about how the church is just maybe disjointed. We are sometimes. And, but the fact is that it's not going to be broken. The church will forever be here, whether it's one person or whether it's hundreds of thousands or millions. The body will be here as long as the Lord delays His coming. We can be part of that body. And that body is going to be eternal. They're in the heavens as well. Those bones, in that sense, will never be broken. Number six, the number six. Six hours. You ever thought about this as you were thinking about I'm going to put both of these up here. But Mark 15, he, he describes the fact that it began the, the ninth hour, or excuse me, the uh, 
6 a.m., wasn't it? 9 a.m. I'm going to have third hour. Thank you. The third hour. I'll tell you what. See, me and my memory, I'm telling you, the third hour, this is what I get for not jotting notes down, but the, the, uh, the third hour of the day, we're talking about uh, 9 a.m., third hour of the day, 9 a.m., when this began. And for six hours, it concluded then, uh, the ninth hour of the day, or 3 uh, p.m. And so you've got from, uh, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in our terms, this is what we can at least hold on to and be sure of, if I'm not confused you. 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. For six hours, our Lord was there on that cross. That's a, that is a long time. When you're doing, you know, we say time flies when you're having fun, and it does. Six hours can go by like that when you're having fun. But what about when you're doing something you really don't want to do? How does time go by then? You, you're watching the clock, if you will. Could you imagine how long that was for our Lord for six hours? I got to thinking about this number six, and, and, and this was a while back now, not in preparation for this lesson, but, and, and I want to do a study on numbers with you very soon because I mention numbers all the time, and, and I think it would help to kind of have these thoughts in mind, but the number six is very significant in the Bible. It represents man, and it represents man's fallibility, sin. When you see six, when God is involved with that number, almost always it's in connection with man and fallibility. It's very interesting. For example, man was created on what day of God's creation? On day six, right? How many cities of refuge were there that man, when his sin had happened, when he had accidentally killed someone, that he could flee to and, and be part of? Well, there were six cities of refuge, right? How many days was man allowed to work uh, each week? Exodus 31 and about verse 15, he was allowed to work six days. I mean, we could go on and on and on with this number. Here, how many hours was Christ on the cross? Why was He there? When I think of that six hours, I think about man. I think about our fallibility and the fact that we're the reason that darkness happened. And, and even literally, the last three hours from 12 to 3, it was complete and utter darkness. And for just a moment, the sin of man had caused Satan to have the victory. For just a moment there, he won. He didn't win the, the, the war, as it were, but he won that battle in which Christ's heel was bruised. But of course, when Christ resurrected from the dead, that all changed. But that had to happen. Those six hours that took place, brutal hours, and what that represents to us is we think about our sin that placed him there and the darkness therein. And then the number seven. The number seven. The seven sayings, of course, of, of Christ. Not that you would have time and you're thinking of the Lord's Supper to maybe go through all of these, but, but you can at least think about the statements that he made. And maybe think of a few of them at least, and, and I'll mention each of them briefly. The first one, Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them. The first thing he says on that cross, so far as I can tell, the first one, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a statement. What would you say? What would you do if your enemies were doing that? I mean, what do you do to your enemies now that, that harm you and hurt you? Do, you? do you show them kindness here? Could you imagine somebody putting you on the cross when you didn't deserve it? And saying to them, Father, I'd like to think that I would say that. I'd like to think that, but I don't know if I'd be strong enough. I, I hope by the power of God I would be, but man, would that be hard to look at them and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's humbling because we recognize Ephesians chapter 4 there. You, you've got to forgive others as, as your Lord forgives you, verse 32 or so. That's, that's humbling. That's hard to do. But my Lord, that's the Lord I'm, I'm serving, the, the one of compassion that He had. And then Luke 23, 43, when he looked at the thief and said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Our saving Lord, as he saved that thief on the cross, took him to paradise with him when he died, the waiting place for heaven. John 19, the third statement there, when he references his mother, and by the way, you can't help but maybe think of his mother who didn't want to be there, but she had to be. She couldn't miss this. But she, she also couldn't stand seeing it either. What a, what a difficult situation for any mother. No mother has ever witnessed something like this mother did. But she's there, and, and John is brother, and he says, Woman, behold thy son, and, and son, behold thy mother. And you remember that, that statement and, and what, what it would have been like for that family to have witnessed that. Not to mention his humiliation and, and hanging there and, and being immodest there in front of his very own mother. What a sad, sad time. John 19 and verse 28 the humanity of our Lord when He said, I thirst. It reminds me of the fact that He decided, He chose to be fully 100% human just as much as He was God. So much that He thirsted just like we did. He hungered just like we did. He endured that pain just like I would if I had to endure that. <clears throat> but He did it so that we don't have to. And then I think about <clears throat> Matthew 27, 46. Excuse me. <clears throat> my God, my God. 
Why hast thou forsaken me? I, this is one of the hardest things for me to think about. The only time in all of eternity that Jesus was separated from His God. He had never been separated from Him. He'd never be separated from Him again. But for a moment, during that six hours, there was a moment that He had never experienced. And it's something we've never even experienced, if you think about it, outside of, of course, uh, having uh, that sin brought into our lives and that connection there. But, but Christ had experienced the fact that He was completely away from God, separated from Him. Outside of that moment in sin, we, you know, you, we, there's a hell, by the way, and there's a place that we'll never we'll be separated for eternity, and that separation is there. But, but for Christ to have to endure that, even for a moment, for God not to be there and for the humanity of Him to ask, Father, why, why is this happening? The mental, the, the human side of Him would have to wonder, why? Why, is this, why, did, why did this have to happen this way? He knew, but He was hurting. And He asked God, we could spend more time on that. But John 19 and verse 30, it is finished. What is finished? The, the plan, the, the mission, the goals, the old fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, all of it, right? Remember, not one jot or tittle is going to be done away until the law is fulfilled. It all happened. Everything was accomplished and finished at that moment. What a statement, John 19, 30. It is finished. I think about that during the Lord's Supper, or we ought to, I should say. And then finally, Luke 23, 46. And this is where we'll conclude. <clears throat> into thy hands, Father, into, my, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. That moment in which his death occurred. He trusted God and he went home. He trusted God and he went home. Maybe, maybe at this point, if you've been thinking about some of these things in the Lord's Supper, you're at the end of the Lord's Supper and, and, and this is the, the lesson at the end of it. This is what we need to remember is that we too need, as it was finished, it was accomplished, he trusted God and went home, I too need to trust God. I need to let this remind me at the end of that communion that I too need to trust God and He will take me home. If I trust Him, if I remain faithful to Him, and there's no greater motivator to do that than the cross of Christ. And when I focus upon that, maybe these things, maybe other things that you like to focus on, but I hope this in some way can be helpful to you as it was to me in preparing the study to, to focus upon things during the Lord's Supper. One Lord. There is one Lord that died on that cross so that we can be saved. There were two thieves that He was numbered with on either side of Him. There were three crosses. The cross of re rejection, the cross of repentance, the cross of uh, redemption. There were four uh, garments, the, the, the tearing of the garments. They were passed out between those soldiers in that seamless tunic that represented that seamless Christ. The five wounds, the, the wounds that He endured so that you and I could be saved. And for six hours, the number of man, the number of fallibility, the number of darkness... Six of them he had to endure it. And then seven statements that he made. And each of them and, and what they represent. Friends, I, I hope uh, this morning that you are a child of God because Jesus says, he's sitting there at the Last Supper, he makes this statement. He says, I will not drink of this again until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The emphasis is that Christ partakes of that. That communion that happens with you in Christ, it happens in the kingdom. Why is it that we say you have to be a Christian in order to partake of the Lord's Supper? In order for it to be done appropriately in the way that God would have you to be, you've got to be a child of God because that's where the communion takes place in His body. And so here's the point. If you're not a Christian this morning, then you're missing out on the opportunity to commune with Christ, to experience the Lord's Supper, to appreciate it as you ought, having been saved by the very death of Jesus Christ. And He will partake of that communion with you right now, or in a few moments, I should say, uh, in His kingdom. It's part of the church. Maybe you'd like to become a Christian and be part of that kingdom through belief, through repentance of sin, confession of your, of your faith, confession that Jesus is the Son of God and, and being buried in that watery grave. The water and the blood washing away all of your sins, not the water, but the blood itself, mingled therein through the, the, the spiritual, through the, the blood of Christ that He shed for you. He'll make that happen. He'll do that work, but you've got to make that decision. Maybe you've done that and and you've railed on Christ, if you will. You've rejected Him through your actions. You've turned away from Him. You've separated yourself from Him. You can come back to Him. If you'll repent of that sin and confess it, and, and take part of that Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, focused on Christ, examining yourself and knowing that you're right with God. Don't let anything hinder you from partaking of that communion in a worthy manner by the grace of God. Whatever uh, your situation might be, if we can assist you in any way, won't you come forward right now? Let us know as we stand and sing together.